and sing it. going to read together from the scriptures, turning once again to Paul's letter to the Colossians. I'd like to read to you, first of all, from chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, and then from chapter 2. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now turning on to chapter two and verse six. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, Continue to live in him, <clears throat> rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by 
the cross. Now, that is not one of the easiest passages of Scripture to understand, but the good news is that the Holy Spirit who inspired it is here with us to interpret it. So we ask him to give us insight. But now let's watch carefully at what Carlos has to communicate to us.
Now, I must start off this morning by making a confession. I was supposed to be here to meet with the interpreters at quarter to eight, but unfortunately, my wife and I do not communicate very well. And I thought that she had organized a wake-up call, and she thought that I had organized a wake-up call, and guess what? Nobody had organized a wake-up call. And so at 25 minutes to nine, the telephone rang in our room, and there was a reminder that I was to be here at nine o'clock. Fortunately, I woke up, and I am here. I'm reminded of the story. <laughs> Well, thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> I'm reminded of the story of the preacher who dreamt that he was preaching and woke up and discovered that he was. <laughs> I'm sure the translators can have a wonderful time translating that. Hmm. Well, now let's look into Colossians again this morning, and I want you to notice three particular things from this passage of Scripture. First of all, there's a description of what we were. Now, Paul, of course, is talking to Christians. He's talking to believers, and he describes to them, first of all, what we were. But then secondly, he describes to them what we are. But then thirdly, he describes to us where we are going. And then, fourthly, he tells us what we should be doing. And that just about covers it all. What we were, what we are, where we are going, and what we should be doing. A young man was driving in his bright red sports car in England one day. He came to a crossroads, and sitting by the crossroad was an old man <clears throat> who'd been born in the area. He'd never moved very far. He was sitting there quietly, the young man in his sports car looked at the old man and said, I say, can you tell me the way to London? No, said the old man. Well, can you tell me the way to Oxford? No, said the old man. Well, which way is it to Cambridge? I don't know. I say, you don't know very much, do you? No. But I'm not lost. <laughs> now, there are some people who don't know where they are. And there are some people who don't know where they're going. And some don't even know where they've been. They're lost. But on the other hand, a Christian is able to say, I know where I am, and I know where I was, and I know where I'm going, <laughs> and I know what I'm doing in between where I was and where I'm going. Now, if you're not clear about any of these things, I trust you will be as we study this scripture together. First of all, verse 21 of Colossians chapter 1. Notice what Paul says concerning what we once were. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. Notice the word alienated from God. To be an alien means that you are living in a country that is not your own. You don't understand the language. You don't like 
the food, you feel that nothing is right. You feel very uncomfortable. You are a stranger there. What a description of many people's attitude to God. They don't like the way God talks. They feel uncomfortable thinking about spiritual things. They don't make sense. They're not in touch with God. They are strangers. Karl Marx said that the, one of the great, great problems of humanity was that people were alienated from each other. They were strangers to each other. And in many ways, he was right. But what he did not understand is that the root spiritual problem for humanity is that men and women made by God, made for God, responsible to God, have become alienated from God. There is something missing in their lives. You will often hear people testify, there's something missing in my life. I'm looking for something. I remember many years ago picking up a hitchhiker here in Europe. And he was an English boy, and he was many, many miles from home. And I asked him what he was doing. And he gave me the answer that many young people were giving in those days. He said, I'm looking for myself. And I said, well, you're sitting right there. And I thought that was extremely funny. <laughs> and he didn't think it was funny at all. He was alienated from God, alienated from other people. In fact, a stranger to himself. That is the picture that Paul paints here. We are alienated from God. But then notice that there's something even more serious. Not only does he say we were alienated from God, but he then says we were enemies in our minds. In other words, he's now talking about our attitudes to God. Let's face it. Many of us can look at back in our lives to times when we did not want to do what God told us to do. We did not like the idea that God has given as commandments. We did not like the idea that they are stated in negative terms. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. In fact, the more we heard thou shalt not, the more we decided, oh yes, I shall. So that if God says, don't do it, something inside says, I want to do it. In fact, if we were really honest, we didn't want to do it until we discovered that God had said, don't do it. It was almost as if we discovered that we were quietly enemies of God in our attitudes. But there's a third thing that Paul says here. Alienated from God with attitudes against God. But then he says, it's not just our attitudes, it's our behavior. For if we're alienated from God and we have a bad attitude towards God, we will engage in activities that are contrary to what God expects from us. And Paul calls that evil behavior. Now, is this a good description of many people today? And the answer is, oh yes. I find many people who say, I don't believe the Bible. So I read that a verse like that to them and say, well, does that describe you? And they say, Oh, yeah. Good. Well, at least we've found one verse in the Bible that you believe. So there is a description of what we are before 
we find Christ. <clears throat> but now moving on quickly, let's notice what the Apostle Paul says concerning the present condition of the believer. What we were, he has described, now what we are. Notice how verse 22 starts, but now. Now, whenever you find the word but in the Bible, it's an important word. It introduces something that is different from what has been said. So, he has described the condition of the unbeliever. And having described it, he then says, but now let me introduce you to something that is totally different. And he then describes the condition of the believer. Verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Notice that he makes a very strong emphasis on the reality of Christ's incarnation. Incarnation is simply a long word which means Christ taking a human body, Christ really being born, Christ the Son of God adding to his deity our humanity. Jesus Christ, God's Son, fully man. The reason he stresses this, of course, is that there were heretical teachers in those days who doubted whether Jesus was truly God and man. There are still people who doubt this, and it's easy to understand why because it is impossible for us to fully understand how Jesus can be fully God and fully man. But it was necessary for Jesus to be fully God and fully man in order to do what he came to do, which was, as a God-man, he would take our sin and he himself would accept the penalty for sin, which is death. So Paul is saying, Christ not only was fully God and fully man, but in his human body, as God, he accepted our sin, and he bore the consequences of our sin, the judgment of God against our sin, and he died on the cross. Now, put in its simplest terms, what that means is that I can learn something that the Apostle Paul learned and say this, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That is the most wonderful, simple, profound truth. That God in Christ died on the cross for my sins in order that I might be reconciled to God. Now, to be reconciled means that once I was a stranger, but now I have been welcomed home. Many years ago, I received a letter from Poland. It was an invitation to attend the Polish millennium. Now, I thought it was a joke. I thought some strange preacher friends of mine were teasing me, so I didn't do anything with the letter. Then I got a telephone call from Poland saying, did you receive our letter inviting you to the Polish millennium? I said, well, yes, what, what is it? 
They said it is 1,000 years since Christianity came to Poland, and we invite you to come to Poland. Now, this was in the 1960s, long, long time ago. So I said, well, why are you inviting me? They said, well, to be quite honest, the Catholics wanted the Pope to come, but the Communists stopped it. And the Baptists, they wanted Billy Graham to come, but the Catholics stopped it. And there's a big argument going on between the Pope and Billy Graham and the Communists and the Catholics and the Baptists. I said, well, where do I come in? And they said, well, nobody has ever heard of you. <laughs> so while they're arguing, we'll slip you in. So I said, all right. So I flew to Warsaw. They said, now don't bring any names, no addresses, no telephone numbers, no letters, just come and we will meet you. So I did what I was told. I arrived at Warsaw Airport. Guess what? No one met me. I had no Polish money, no telephone numbers, no addresses, nothing. The airport emptied Nobody was left. They came to close it up. It was cold and snowing, and I felt a stranger. Why am I here, I thought. I could be home with my wife and my children. I was feeling very sorry for myself. I was saying, oh, Lord, I don't like it here. I'm going to find the first plane out of here. So I checked, and the next plane out of Warsaw in those days was in about three weeks. <laughs> so I stood there for half an hour. The longer the time went on, the worse it was. And then something wonderful happened. I heard a voice say, Prisco. I turned round, and there was a man in a long leather coat with the collar turned up, <laughs> with a big hat on, with the brim turned down. His hands were in his pockets. And I said, oh, oh, I, I'll, I'll come quietly. <laughs> and then he did something that was worse than being arrested. He grabbed hold of me, and he kissed me. <laughs> once on the left, once on the right, and once right on the middle. <laughs> and I thought, I really do need the next plane out of here. Welcome, Brother Briscoe. He said, welcome, Brother Briscoe. I'm sorry I'm late. So we got on the tram car into town. It was full of people. We held on the strap and we went along. <laughs> I've been watching Carlos. <laughs> As we went along, he said to me, Speak loudly of Jesus. I said, I, I don't know Polish. He said, you know German. No. Oh, speak loudly of Jesus in English and German. So I spoke loudly of Jesus hanging on the strap. <laughs> Everybody got quiet inside. They started to listen. And I thought, the communists will arrest me any minute now, but my friend was smiling. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, this is wonderful. A few minutes ago, I wanted to go home. I was a stranger. 
I was alienated, but now I was with my brother. I was comfortable. I was happy. I was thrilled with my new experience. And therein lies the picture of the believer. This is what I once was. This is what I have become. I was alienated. I am now reconciled. I was a stranger. Now I am received, and life has been changed. But that's not all. For the third thing that we now read is about where we are going. Verse 23 of chapter 1. I'll need to read verse 22 so we get the sense. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Where are we going? We are going to be presented. That is what we're told. We're going to be presented. That speaks about something in the future. The moment we trust Christ, we have been reconciled. We are received by God. But in the future, when we die, or when Christ returns, we will be presented as forgiven sinners to the living God. Now that, in many ways, is a very frightening thought. Me, presented to the living God, thinking of all that I have done, and all that I have said, all my sinfulness, I am going to stand before God, yes, but the good news is this, I have been forgiven. I have been reconciled to God. My sins have been blotted out, and here's the description of how I will be presented to God. I will be presented wholly in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Now this is very exciting. Now you will notice the word holy. I just said this was exciting, but I have noticed something. Many people, as soon as you talk about holy, don't get excited. The thought of holiness is not very pleasant to them at all. Let me describe holy to you. It's a wonderful word. Now, some Bible scholars will tell you that the original word in the Bible translated holy in our languages really meant to cut, as with a knife, to cut. Now, let me give you an illustration. You will remember the illustration. You may not remember what it illustrates. You're at home. You are making supper ready. You are preparing a salad. You're cutting up all the ingredients. The telephone rings. You're distracted. You cut your finger. You pick up the phone. It's your wife. Hello, she says. Did you remember to take the children to school? Have you done the laundry? Did you check on the dog? 
She goes on with all the details because you are looking after the house. And she says, I've had a wonderful day at the office. My managers have been, they've given me a promotion, I've got a raise, everything is very exciting. Oh, and by the way, I've invited them home for dinner. I'm sorry I didn't give you much warning, but you're so wonderful at getting a meal ready quickly. Oh, and by the way, I'm calling from my car and we'll be home in two minutes. I love you. Bye. And you say, hmm, a typical thoughtless woman. <laughs> then you look back to where you're preparing the salad. There it is all neatly chopped up. But then you notice something else. You had forgotten you had cut your finger. And there, lying beside the salad, is the end of your finger. It is cut. It is separate. It is different. It is distinct. It is totally other. It has been set apart. Now notice all those words, cut, separate, distinct, set apart, holy other. They all describe holy. You have been set apart. You are made different. You are holy other. You belong to him. Not only that, you are now without blemish. All the old things have been washed away. Not only that, all the things that you were guilty of have been forgiven. My wife says that when she was a young Christian, she used to talk to God about some of the things she had done. And she would say to him, Oh God, do you remember when I did that? And God said, No. But God, you must remember. No. But God, that awful thing that I did, you remember that? No. Why? Because he promises your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. And the good news is this. What you were, you no longer are. But what you are, you will no longer be. For one day you will be presented holy, without blemish, utterly, totally forgiven. That's where we're going. Notice, however, one very important thing. Verse 23, this happens if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Now, there are some people who will struggle with this verse because they will say, well, I thought that if you were saved, once you're saved, you're always saved. And they will believe that very firmly. And other people will say, if you're elect, you're elect and you will 
go to heaven. And other people will say, it says here that it is necessary for you to continue in the faith. So there are some people who will say, once you're saved, you're always saved. And other people will say, you can be saved, but you can lose your salvation. Now, this is one of the great points of discussion right through church history. What it seems to be saying here is this, that our salvation is dependent on God reaching out and taking hold of us. But he expects us to hold on to him. But the important thing to remember is the more we understand how he is holding us, the more we will have the desire to continue and to hold on to him. Now, this is something that no doubt you can discuss and debate among yourselves. But the expectation is this, that we should continue in the faith. And we continue in the faith because we know that God continues to hold on to us. So, we have seen what we were, we see what we are, we understand where we're going. Now the big question is, well, what do we do until we get there? And that, of course, is the next thing that he talks about. Starting now with verse 6, of chapter 2. Notice, first of all, verses 6 and 7 say, one thing we should be doing is, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thanksgiving. Now, there are a lot of instructions there. I can only identify them for you. Number one, notice who it was you received. You received Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, sometimes you'll hear people getting into another point of discussion. They will say, well, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, but then ten years later, I accepted him as my Lord. And other people will say, you can't do that. You can't accept him as Savior and then later accept him as Lord. This raises a problem. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, we often know very little about Him. We often learn very little about the changes that He will make in our lives. So some people will say, I didn't know any of that when I trusted myself to Christ, so I accepted Him as Savior, and it was only later I learned about his lordship. That's true of everybody I know. But one thing we must understand, when we invite the Lord Jesus into our lives, it is the Lord Jesus. He comes into our lives not just to live in one little corner of our lives, he comes into our lives to be the Lord, to be our master, to control and to direct our lives. And we need to understand from the earliest days of our experience of Christ that we not only receive a Savior, but we receive a Lord. Now, I have been a Christian since I was a young boy. I'm now 65 years of age. 
I can look back over almost 60 years of being a Christian. But I have to tell you this, that I still need to acknowledge his lordship. He continues to show me areas of my life where he wants to be in control. I received him as my savior, I learned early that he wanted to be my Lord. But as the days go by, I continue to trust him and I continue to obey him as Lord. That was who I received. Now, in the same way that I received him, what am I to do? I am to continue to live in the way I received him. I am to be rooted in him like a tree so that when the strong winds blow, I will be strong in him. I am to be built firmly on him like a building in an area where they have earthquakes so that when the earthquakes come, the building will stand firm. I am to go on being strengthened in the faith. I am to learn more and more about the faith, discover strength from it. And all the time, I am to be thankful for who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised me in the future. So, what should I be doing? I should be continuing, living in him, rooted like a tree, built up like a building, strengthened in the faith, and all the time overflowing with thankfulness to God. That's the first thing I need to be doing at the present time. Here's the second thing. I need to be aware of the dangers all around me. Verse eight tells me about that. There will be those people who will teach me things that are wrong. They will affect my faith. They will lead me into error. The third thing that I need to do I need to be continually accepting instruction. I need to learn more and more about my relationship with Christ. I don't have time to give you the details, but I can simply outline it for you. Verse nine, I need to be instructed about the fact that I have received fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. I need to be instructed about having put off the old life. I need to be instructed about the fact that in my baptism, I have testified to the old life being over, and I have now been raised in newness of life. I need to be instructed about what it means to be a new person. One story to illustrate this, and then I will finish. One of the great figures in church history is Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo. Before he went to Milan to study rhetoric, he had a mistress. He never married this woman, he lived with her for many years, and he had a son by her. When he went off to Milan, studying rhetoric, he knew that the bishop was a great speaker. So he used to go and listen to the bishop of Milan speaking. He wasn't interested in the gospel, but eventually Augustine became a Christian. He was baptized in the cathedral in Milan. Then eventually, he went back home. When he went back home, his mistress, the mother of his little boy, 
heard that he was home, so she came to his house and she knocked on the door. And she said, Augustine, Augustine, it is I, it is I. And he refused to open the door. And he said, yes, that is true, but it is no longer I. What he meant by that was, having acknowledged Christ, he had died to the old life, he had been raised into new life. And so he could say with the Apostle Paul, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So what should we be doing? We know what we were, we know what we are, we know what we will become, but what do we do in the interim? We deepen in our relationship with him as we discover more and more of what it means to continue to live in Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, by your Holy Spirit, help us to understand these things so that we will know where we are. We will know where we're going. We'll know where we were. And we will live in continual thankfulness in our relationship with Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.